Section 50 of Library of the World's Best Literature, Ancient and Modern, Volume 1. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information, or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Michael Wolfe. Library of the World's Best Literature, Ancient and Modern, Volume 1. Section 50. Selections from Holland and its People by Edmondo de Amicis. The Land of Pluck from Holland and its People. Whoever looks for the first time at a large map of Holland wonders that a country so constituted can continue to exist. At the first glance, it is difficult to see whether land or water predominates, or whether Holland belongs most to the continent or to the sea. Those broken and compressed coasts, those deep bays, those great rivers that, losing the aspect of rivers, seem bringing new seas to the sea. That sea which, changing itself into rivers, penetrates the land and breaks into archipelagos. The lakes, the vast morasses, the canals crossing and recrossing each other, all combine to give the idea of a country that may at any moment disintegrate and disappear. Seals and beavers would seem to be its rightful inhabitants, but since there are men bold enough to live in it, they surely cannot ever sleep in peace. What sort of a country Holland is has been told by many in few words. Napoleon said it was an alluvion of French rivers, the Rhine, the Scheldt, and the Meuse, and with this pretext he added it to the empire. One writer has defined it as a sort of transition between land and sea another as an immense crust of earth floating on the water, others an annex of the old continent, the China of Europe, the end of the earth, and the beginning of the ocean, a measureless raft of mud and sand, and Philip the Second called it the country nearest to hell. But they all agreed upon one point, and all expressed it in the same words. Holland is a conquest made by man over the sea. It is an artificial country. The Hollanders made it. It exists because the Hollanders preserve it. It will vanish whenever the Hollanders shall abandon it. To comprehend this truth, we must imagine Holland as it was when first inhabited by the first German tribes that wandered away in search of a country. It was almost uninhabitable. There were vast, tempestuous lakes like seas touching one another, morass beside morass, one tract after another covered with brushwood, immense forests of pines, oaks, and alders, traversed by herds of wild horses, and so thick were these forests that tradition says one could travel leagues passing from tree to tree without ever putting foot to the ground. The deep bays and gulfs carried into the heart of the country the fury of the northern tempests. Some provinces disappeared once every year under the waters of the sea, and were nothing but muddy tracts, neither land nor water, where it was impossible either to walk or to sail. The large rivers, without sufficient inclination to descend to the sea, wandered here and there uncertain of their way, and slept in monstrous pools and ponds among the sands of the coasts. It was a sinister place, swept by furious winds, beaten by obstinate rains, veiled in a perpetual fog, where nothing was heard but the roar of the sea and the voices of wild beasts and birds of the ocean. The first people who had the courage to plant their tents there had to raise with their own hands dikes of earth to keep out the rivers and the sea, and lived within them like shipwrecked men upon desolate islands, venturing forth at the subsidence of the waters in quest of food in the shape of fish and game and gathering the eggs of marine birds upon the sand. Caesar, passing by, was the first to name this people. The other Latin historians speak with compassion and respect of these intrepid barbarians who lived upon a floating land, exposed to the intemperance of a cruel sky and the fury of the mysterious northern sea. And the imagination pictures the Roman soldiers who, from the heights of the uttermost citadels of the empire, beaten by the waves, contemplated with wonder and pity those wandering tribes upon their desolate land like a race accursed of heaven. Now if we remember that such a region has become one of the most fertile, wealthiest, and best regulated of the countries of the world, we shall understand the justice of the saying that Holland is a conquest made by man. But, it must be added, the conquest goes on for ever. To explain this fact, to show how the existence of Holland, in spite of the great defensive works constructed by the inhabitants, demands an incessant and most perilous struggle, 
it will be enough to touch here and there upon a few of the principal vicissitudes of her physical history, from the time when her inhabitants had already reduced her to a habitable country. Tradition speaks of a great inundation in Friesland in the sixth century. From that time, every gulf, every island, and it may be said every city in Holland, has its catastrophe to record. In thirteen centuries, it is recorded that one great inundation besides smaller ones has occurred every seven years, and the country being all plain, these inundations were veritable floods. Towards the end of the thirteenth century, the sea destroyed a part of a fertile peninsula near the mouth of the Ems, and swallowed up more than thirty villages. In the course of the same century, a series of inundations opened an immense chasm in northern Holland, and formed the Zuiderzee causing the death of more than 80,000 persons. In 1421, a tempest swelled the Meuse, so that in one night the waters overwhelmed 72 villages and 100,000 inhabitants. In 1532, the sea burst the dikes of Zeeland, destroying hundreds of villages and covering forever a large tract of country. In 1570, a storm caused another inundation in Zeeland and in the province of Utrecht. Amsterdam was invaded by the waters, and in Friesland 20,000 people were drowned. Other great inundations took place in the 17th century, two terrible ones at the beginning and the end of the 18th, one in 1825 that desolated North Holland, Friesland, Overijssel, and Gelders, and another great one of the Rhine, in 1855, which invaded Gelders and the province of Utrecht, and covered a great part of North Brabant. Beside these great catastrophes, there happened in different centuries innumerable smaller ones which would have been famous in any other country but which in Holland are scarcely remembered, like the rising of the Lake of Haarlem, itself the result of an inundation of the sea, flourishing cities of the Gulf of Zuiderzee vanished under the waters, the islands of Zeeland covered again and again by the sea and again emerging, villages of the coast from Helder to the mouths of the Meuse, from time to time inundated and destroyed, and in all these inundations immense loss of life of men and animals. It is plain that miracles of courage, constancy, and industry must have been accomplished by the Hollanders, first in creating, and afterwards in preserving such a country. The enemy from which they had to rest it was triple. The sea, the lakes, the rivers. They drained the lakes, drove back the sea, and imprisoned the rivers. To drain the lakes, the Hollanders pressed the air into their service. The lakes, the marshes, were surrounded by dikes, the dikes by canals, and an army of windmills, putting in motion force-pumps, turned the water into the canals, which carried it off to the rivers and the sea. Thus vast tracts of land, buried under the water, saw the sun, and were transformed, as if by magic, into fertile fields covered with villages, and intersected by canals and roads. In the seventeenth century, in less than forty years, twenty-six lakes were drained. At the beginning of the present century, in North Holland alone, more than six thousand hectares, or fifteen thousand acres, were thus redeemed from the waters. In South Holland, before 1844, twenty-nine thousand hectares. In the whole of Holland, from 1500 to 1858, three hundred and fifty-five thousand hectares. Substituting steam mills for windmills, in thirty-nine months was completed the great undertaking of the draining of the Lake of Haarlem, which measured forty-four kilometres in circumference, and forever threatened with its tempests the cities of Haarlem, Amsterdam, and Leiden. And they are now meditating the prodigious work of drying up the Zuiderzee, which embraces an area of more than seven hundred square kilometres. The rivers, another eternal enemy, cost no less of labour and sacrifice. Some, like the Rhine, which lost itself in the sands before reaching the sea, had to be channelled and defended at their mouths against the tides by formidable cataracts. Others, like the Meuse, bordered by dikes as powerful as those that were raised against the ocean. Others turned from their course. The wandering waters gathered together, the course of the affluence regulated, the waters divided with rigorous measure in order to retain that enormous mass of liquid in equilibrium, where the slightest inequality might cost a province and in this way all the rivers that formerly spread their devastating floods about the country were disciplined into channels and constrained to do service. But the most tremendous struggle was the battle with the ocean. Holland is in great part lower than the level of the sea. Consequently, everywhere that the coast is not defended by sandbanks, it has to be protected by dikes. 
if these interminable bulwarks of earth, granite, and wood were not there to attest the indomitable courage and perseverance of the Hollanders, it would not be believed that the hand of man could even in many centuries have accomplished such a work. In Zealand alone the dikes extend to a distance of more than four hundred kilometres. The western coast of the island of Walcheren is defended by a dike in which it is computed that the expense of construction added to that of preservation, if it were put out at interest, would amount to a sum equal in value to that which the dike itself would be worth were it made of massive copper. Around the city of Helder, at the northern extremity of North Holland, extends a dike ten kilometres long, constructed of masses of Norwegian granite, which descends more than sixty metres into the sea. The whole province of Friesland, for the length of eighty-eight kilometres, is defended by three rows of piles sustained by masses of Norwegian and German granite. Amsterdam, all the cities of the Zuiderzee and all the islands, fragments of vanished lands, which are strung like beads between Friesland and North Holland, are protected by dikes. From the mouths of the Ems to those of the Skelt, Holland is an impenetrable fortress, of whose immense bastions the mills are the towers, the cataracts are the gates, the islands the advanced forts, and like a true fortress it shows to its enemy, the sea, only the tops of its bell-towers and the roofs of its houses, as if in defiance and derision. Holland is a fortress, and her people live, as in a fortress, on a war footing with the sea. An army of engineers, directed by the Minister of the Interior, spread over the country, and, ordered like an army, continually spy the enemy, watch over the internal waters, foresee the bursting of the dikes, order and direct the defensive works. The expenses of the war are divided. One part to the state, one part to the provinces, every proprietor pays, beside the general imposts, a special impost for the dikes, in proportion to the extent of his lands and their proximity to the water. An accidental rupture, an inadvertence, may cause a flood. The peril is unceasing, the sentinels are at their posts upon the bulwarks. At the first assault of the sea, they shout the war-cry, and Holland sends men, material, and money. And even when there is no great battle, a quiet, silent struggle is forever going on. The innumerable mills, even in the drained districts, continue to work unresting, to absorb and turn into the canals the water that falls in rain and that which filters in from the sea. Every day the cataracts of the bays and rivers close their gigantic gates against the high tide trying to rush into the heart of the land. The work of strengthening dikes, fortifying sandbanks with plantations, throwing out new dikes where the banks are low, straight as great lances, vibrating in the bosom of the sea and breaking the first impetus of the wave, is forever going on. And the sea eternally knocks at the river gates, beats upon the ramparts, growls on every side her ceaseless menace, lifting her curious waves as if to see the land she counts as hers, piling up banks of sand before the gates to kill the commerce of the cities, forever gnawing, scratching, digging at the coast and failing to overthrow the ramparts upon which she foams and fumes in angry effort, she casts at their feet ships full of the dead, that they may announce to the rebellious country her fury and her strength. In the midst of this great and terrible struggle, Holland is transformed. Holland is the land of transformations. A geographical map of that country, as it existed eight centuries ago, is not recognizable. Transforming the sea, men also are transformed. The sea, at some points, drives back the land. It takes portions from the continent, leaves them, and takes them again, joins islands to the mainland with ropes of sand, as in the case of Zealand, breaks off bits from the mainland, and makes new islands, as in Wieringen, retires from certain coasts, and makes land cities out of what were cities of the sea, as Leeuwarden, converts vast tracts of plain into archipelagos of a hundred islets, as Biesbos, separates a city from the land, as Dordrecht, forms new gulfs two leagues broad, like the Gulf of Dollart, divides two provinces with the new sea, like North Holland and Friesland. The effect of the inundations is to cause the level of the sea to rise in some places, and to sink in others. Sterile lands are fertilized by the slime of the rivers, fertile lands are changed into deserts of sand. With the transformations of the waters alternate the transformations of labor. Islands are united to continents, like the island of Armeland. Entire provinces are reduced to islands, as North Holland will be by the new canal of Amsterdam, which is to separate it from South Holland, 
lakes as large as provinces disappear altogether, like the Lake of Beemster. By the extraction of peat, land is converted into lakes, and these lakes are again transformed into meadows, and thus the country changes its aspect according to the violence of nature or the needs of men. And while one goes over it with the latest map in hand, one may be sure that the map will be useless in a few years, because even now there are new gulfs in process of formation, tracts of land just ready to be detached from the mainland, and great canals being cut that will carry life to uninhabited districts. But Holland has done more than defend herself against the waters. She has made herself mistress of them, and has used them for her own defence. Should a foreign army invade her territory, she has but to open her dikes and unchain the sea and the rivers, as she did against the Romans, against the Spaniards, against the army of Louis the Fourteenth, and defend the land cities with her fleet. Water was the source of her poverty, she has made it the source of wealth. Over the whole country extends an immense network of canals, which serves both for the irrigation of the land and as a means of communication. The cities, by means of canals, communicate with the sea. Canals run from town to town, and from them to villages, which are themselves bound together by these watery ways, and are connected even to the houses scattered over the country. Smaller canals surround the fields and orchards, pastures and kitchen gardens, serving at once as boundary wall, hedge and roadway. Every house is a little port. Ships, boats, rafts move about in all directions, as in other places carts and carriages. The canals are the arteries of Holland, and the water her life-blood. But even setting aside the canals, the draining of the lakes, and the defensive works, on every side are seen the traces of marvellous undertakings. The soil, which in other countries is a gift of nature, is in Holland a work of men's hands. Holland draws the greater part of her wealth from commerce, but before commerce comes the cultivation of the soil, and the soil had to be created. There were sandbanks interspersed with layers of peat, broad downs swept by the winds, great tracts of barren land apparently condemned to an eternal sterility. The first elements of manufacture, iron and coal, were wanting. There was no wood, because the forests had already been destroyed by tempests when agriculture began. There was no stone, there were no metals. Nature, says the Dutch poet, had refused all her gifts to Holland. The Hollanders had to do everything in spite of nature. They began by fertilizing the sand. In some places they formed a productive soil with earth brought from a distance, as a garden is made. They spread the silicious dust of the downs over the two watery meadows. They mixed with the sandy earth the remains of peat taken from the bottoms. They extracted clay to lend fertility to the surface of their lands. They labored to break up the downs with the plough, and thus, in a thousand ways, and continually fighting off the menacing waters, they succeeded in bringing Holland to a state of cultivation not inferior to that of more favored regions. That Holland, that sandy, marshy country which the ancients considered all but uninhabitable, now sends out yearly from her confines agricultural products to the value of a hundred millions of francs, possesses about one million three hundred thousand head of cattle, and in proportion to the extent of her territory may be accounted one of the most populous of European states. It may be easily understood how the physical peculiarities of their country must influence the Dutch people, and their genius is in perfect harmony with the character of Holland. It is sufficient to contemplate the monuments of their great struggle with the sea, in order to understand that their distinctive characteristics must be firmness and patience, accompanied by a calm and constant courage. That glorious battle, and the consciousness of owing everything to their own strength, must have infused and fortified in them a high sense of dignity, an indomitable spirit of liberty and independence. The necessity of a constant struggle, of a continuous labour, and of perpetual sacrifices in defence of their existence, forever taking them back to a sense of reality, must have made them a highly practical and economical people. Good sense should be their most salient quality, economy one of their chief virtues. They must be excellent in all useful arts, sparing of diversion, simple even in their greatness. Succeeding in what they undertake by dint of tenacity and a thoughtful and orderly activity. More wise than heroic, more conservative than creative, giving no great architects to the edifice of modern thought, but the ablest of workmen, a legion of patient and laborious artisans, 
and by virtue of these qualities, of prudence, phlegmatic activity, and the spirit of conservatism, they are ever advancing, though by slow degrees. They acquire gradually, but never lose what they have gained, holding stubbornly to their ancient customs, preserving almost intact, and despite the neighbourhood of three great nations, their own originality, preserving it through every form of government, through foreign invasions, through political and religious wars, and in spite of the immense concourse of strangers from every country that are always coming among them, and remaining, in short, of all the northern races, that one which, though ever advancing in the path of civilization, has kept its antique stamp most clearly. It is enough also to remember its form, in order to comprehend that this country of three million and a half of inhabitants, although bound in so compact a political union, although recognizable among all the other northern peoples by certain traits peculiar to the population of all its provinces, must present a great variety. And so it is, in fact. Between Zealand and Holland proper, between Holland and Friesland, between Friesland and Gelders, between Groningen and Brabant, in spite of vicinity and so many common ticks, there is no less difference than between the more distant provinces of Italy and France. Difference of language, costume and character, difference of race and of religion. The communal regime has impressed an indelible mark upon this people, because in no other country does it so conform to the nature of things. The country is divided into various groups of interests, organized in the same manner as the hydraulic system. Whence, association and mutual help against the common enemy, the sea. But liberty for local institutions and forces. Monarchy has not extinguished the ancient municipal spirit, and this it is that renders impossible a complete fusion of the state, in all the great states that have made the attempt. The great rivers and gulfs are at the same time commercial roads serving as national bonds between the different provinces, and barriers which defend old traditions and old customs in each. THE DUTCH MASTERS FROM HOLLAND AND ITS PEOPLE The Dutch school of painting has one quality which renders it particularly attractive to us Italians. It is above all others the most different from our own, the very antithesis, or the opposite pole of art. The Dutch and Italian schools are the most original, or, has been said, the only two to which the title rigorously belongs, the others being only daughters or younger sisters, more or less resembling them. Thus, even in painting, Holland offers that which is most sought after in travel and in books of travel, the new. Dutch painting was born with the liberty and independence of Holland. As long as the northern and southern provinces of the Low Countries remained under the Spanish rule and in the Catholic faith, Dutch painters painted like Belgian painters. They studied in Belgium, Germany, and Italy. Heemskerk imitated Michelangelo, Blumart followed Correggio, and Il Moro copied Titian, not to indicate others. And they were one and all pedantic imitators, who added to the exaggerations of the Italian style a certain German coarseness, the result of which was a bastard style of painting still inferior to the first, childish, stiff in design, crude in colour, and completely wanting in chiaroscuro, but at least not a servile imitation, and becoming, as it were, a faint prelude of the true Dutch art that was to be. With the War of Independence, Liberty, reform, and painting also were renewed. With religious traditions fell artistic traditions, the nude nymphs, madonnas, saints, allegory, mythology, the ideal. All the old edifice fell to pieces. Holland, animated by a new life, felt the need of manifesting and expanding it in a new way. The small country, become all at once glorious and formidable, felt the desire for illustration. The faculties which had been excited and strengthened in the grand undertaking of creating a nation, now that the work was completed, overflowed and ran into new channels. The conditions of the country were favourable to the revival of art. The supreme dangers were conjured away. There was security, prosperity, a splendid future. The heroes had done their duty, and the artists were permitted to come to the front. Holland, after many sacrifices and much suffering, issued victoriously from the struggle, lifted her face among her people and smiled, and that smile is art. What that art would necessarily be might have been guessed even had no monument of it remained. A pacific, laborious, practical people, continually beaten down to quote a great German poet, to prosaic realities by the occupations of a vulgar burgher life 
cultivating its reason at the expense of its imagination, living consequently more in clear ideas than in beautiful images, taking refuge from abstractions, never darting its thoughts beyond that nature with which it is in perpetual battle, seeing only that which is, enjoying only that which it can possess, making its happiness consist in the tranquil ease and honest sensuality of a life without violent passions or exorbitant desires. Such a people must have tranquillity also in their art. They must love an art that pleases without startling the mind, which addresses the senses rather than the spirit, an art full of repose, precision, and delicacy, though material like their lives. In one word, a realistic art in which they can see themselves as they are and as they are content to be. The artists began by tracing that which they saw before their eyes, the house. The long winters, the persistent rains, the dampness, the variableness of the climate, obliged the Hollander to stay within doors the greater part of the year. He loved his little house, his shell, much better than we love our abodes, for the reason that he had more need of it, and stayed more within it. He provided it with all sorts of conveniences, caressed it, made much of it. He liked to look out from his well-stopped windows at the falling snow and the drenching rain, and to hug himself with the thought, Rage, tempest, I am warm and safe. Snug in his shell, his faithful housewife beside him, his children about him, he passed the long autumn and winter evenings in eating much, drinking much, smoking much, and taking his well-earned ease after the cares of the day were over. The Dutch painters represented these houses and this life in little pictures proportionate to the size of the walls in which they were to hang, the bedchambers that make one feel a desire to sleep the kitchens, the table set out, the fresh and smiling faces of the house-mothers, the men at their ease around the fire, and with that conscientious realism which never forsakes them, they depict the dozing cat, the yawning dog, the clucking hen, the broom, the vegetables, the scattered pots and pans, the chicken ready for the spit. Thus they represent life in all its scenes, and in every grade of the social scale, the dance, the conversazione, the orgy, the feast, the game, and thus did Taburg, Metzu, Netscher, Dau, Miris, Stein, Brauer, and von Ostade become famous. After depicting the house, they turned their attention to the country. The stern climate allowed but a brief time for the admiration of nature, but for this very reason Dutch artists admired her all the more. They saluted the spring with a livelier joy, and permitted that fugitive smile of heaven to stamp itself more deeply on their fancy. The country was not beautiful, but it was twice dear because it had been torn from the sea and from the foreign oppressor. The Dutch artist painted it lovingly. He represented it simply, ingeniously, with a sense of intimacy which at that time was not to be found in Italian or Belgian landscape. The flat, monotonous country had, to the Dutch painter's eyes, a marvellous variety. He caught all the mutations of the sky, and knew the value of the water, with its reflections, its grace and freshness, and its power of illuminating everything. Having no mountains, he took the dikes for background. With no forests, he imparted to a single group of trees all the mystery of a forest, and he animated the whole with beautiful animals and white sails. The subjects of their pictures are poor enough. A windmill, a canal a grey sky. But how they make one think! A few Dutch painters, not content with nature in their own country, came to Italy in search of hills, luminous skies, and famous ruins. And another band of select artists is the result. Bott, Swanevelt, Peinacker, Breinberg, Van Laar, Asselijn. But the palm remains with the landscapists of Holland, with Weinantz, the painter of morning, with Van der Neer, the painter of night, with Rausdahl, the painter of melancholy, with Hobbemar, the illustrator of windmills, cabins, and kitchen gardens, and with others who have restricted themselves to the expression of the enchantment of nature as she is in Holland. Simultaneously with landscape art was born another kind of painting, especially peculiar to Holland. Animal painting. Animals are the riches of the country, that magnificent race of cattle which has no rival in Europe for fecundity and beauty. The Hollanders, who owe so much to them, treat them, one may say, as part of the population. They wash them, comb them, dress them, and love them dearly. They are to be seen everywhere. They are reflected in all the canals, and dot with points of black and white the immense fields that stretch on every side. 
giving an air of peace and comfort to every place, and exciting in the spectator's heart a sentiment of Arcadian gentleness and patriarchal serenity. The Dutch artists studied these animals in all their varieties, in all their habits, and divined, as one may say, their inner life and sentiments, animating the tranquil beauty of the landscape with their forms. Rubens, Lauders, Paul de Vos, and other Belgian painters had drawn animals with admirable mastery, but all these are surpassed by the Dutch artists van der Velde, Berchem, Cagel du Jardin, and by the prince of animal painters, Paul Potter whose famous bull in the gallery of the Hague deserves to be placed in the Vatican besides the transfiguration by Raphael. In yet another field are the Dutch painters great, the sea. The sea, their enemy, their power and their glory, forever threatening their country and entering in a hundred ways into their lives and fortunes, that turbulent north sea, full of sinister colour, with a light of infinite melancholy upon it, beating forever upon a desolate coast, must subjugate the imagination of the artists. He passes, indeed, long hours on the shore, contemplating its tremendous beauty, ventures upon its waves to study the effects of tempests, buys a vessel and sails with his wife and family, observing and making notes, follows the fleet into battle and takes part in the fight, and in this way are made marine painters like William van der Velde the Elder and William the Younger, like Buckhausen, Dubbles and Stork. Another kind of painting was to arise in Holland as the expression of the character of the people and of republican manners. A people which without greatness had done so many great things, as Michelet says, must have its heroic painters, if we call them so, destined to illustrate men and events. But this school of painting, precisely because the people were without greatness, or to express it better, without the form of greatness, modest, inclined to consider all equal before the country, because all had done their duty, abhorring adulation and the glorification in one only of the virtues and the triumph of many, this school has to illustrate not a few men who have excelled, and a few extraordinary facts, but all classes of citizenship gathered among the most ordinary and pacific of burgher life. From this come the great pictures, which represent five, ten, thirty persons together, arquebusiers, mayors, officers, professors, magistrates, administrators, seated or standing around a table, feasting and conversing, of life-size most faithful likenesses, grave, open faces, expressing that secure serenity of conscience by which may be divined rather than seen the nobleness of a life consecrated to one's country, the character of that strong, laborious epoch, the masculine virtues of that excellent generation. All this set off by the fine costume of the time, so admirably combining grace and dignity, those gorgets, those doublets, those black mantles, those silken scarves and ribbons, those arms and banners. In this field stand pre-eminent van der Helst, Hals, Hovart, Flink, and Ball. Descending from the consideration of the various kinds of painting, to the special manner by means of which the artist excelled in treatment, one leads all the rest as the distinctive feature of Dutch painting. The Light The light in Holland, by reason of the particular conditions of its manifestation, could not fail to give rise to a special manner of painting. A pale light, waving with marvellous mobility through an atmosphere impregnated with vapour, a nebulous veil continually and abruptly torn, a perpetual struggle between light and shadow, such was the spectacle which attracted the eye of the artist. He began to observe and to reproduce all this agitation of the heavens, this struggle which animates with varied and fantastic life the solitude of nature in Holland, and in representing it, the struggle passed into his soul, and instead of representing, he created. Then he caused the two elements to contend under his hand. He accumulated darkness that he might split and seam it with all manner of luminous effects and sudden gleams of light. Sunbeams darted through the rifts, sunset reflections and the yellow rays of lamplight were blended with delicate manipulation into mysterious shadows, and their dim depths were peopled with half-seen forms, and thus he created all sorts of contrast, enigmas, play and effect of strange and unexpected chiaroscuro. In this field, among many, stand conspicuous Gerard Dau, the author of the famous four-candle picture, and the great magician and sovereign illuminator, Rembrandt. Another marked feature of Dutch painting was to be colour. Besides the generally accepted reasons that in a country where there are no mountainous horizons, no varied prospects, no great coup d'oeil, 
no forms, in short, that lend themselves to design, the artist's eye must inevitably be attracted by colour, and that this might be peculiarly the case in Holland, where the uncertain light, the fog-veiled atmosphere, confuse and blend the outlines of all objects, so that the eye, unable to fix itself upon the form, flies to colour as the principal attribute that nature presents to it. Besides these reasons, there is the fact that in a country so flat, so uniform, and so grey as Holland, there is the same need of colour, as in southern lands there is need of shade. The Dutch artists did but follow the imperious taste of their countrymen, who painted their houses in vivid colours, as well as their ships, and in some places the trunks of their trees, and the palings and fences of their fields and gardens, whose dress was of the gayest, richest hues, who loved tulips and hyacinths even to madness. And thus the Dutch painters were potent colourists, and Rembrandt was their chief. Realism, natural to the calmness and slowness of the Dutch character, was to give to their art yet another distinctive feature. Finish, which was carried to the very extreme of possibility. It is truly said that the leading quality of the people may be found in their pictures, viz. patience. Everything is represented with the minuteness of a daguerreotype. Every vein in the wood of a piece of furniture, every fibre in a leaf, the threads of cloth, the stitches in a patch, every hair upon an animal's coat, every wrinkle in a man's face, everything finished with microscopic precision, as if done with a fairy pencil, or at the expense of the painter's eyes and reason. In reality a defect rather than excellence, since the office of painting is to represent not what is, but what the eye sees, and the eye does not see everything but a defect carried to such a pitch of perfection that one admires and does not find fault. In this respect, the most famous prodigies of patience were Dow, Mieris, Potter, and van der Heist, but more or less all the Dutch painters. But realism, which gives to Dutch art so original a stamp and such admirable qualities, is yet the root of its most serious defects. The artists, desirous only of representing material truths, gave to their figures no expression save that of their physical sentiments. Grief, love, enthusiasm, and the thousand delicate shades of feeling that have no name, or take a different one with the different causes that give rise to them, they express rarely, or not at all. For them the heart does not beat, the eyes do not weep, the lips do not quiver. One whole side of the human soul, the noblest and highest, is wanting in their pictures more in their faithful reproduction of everything, even the ugly, and especially the ugly, they end by exaggerating even that, making defects into deformities, and portraits into caricatures. They calumniate the national type, they give a burlesque and graceless aspect to the human countenance. In order to have the proper background for such figures, they are constrained to choose trivial subjects. Hence the great number of pictures representing beer-shops and drinkers with the grotesque, stupid faces, in absurd attitudes. Ugly women and ridiculous old men, scenes in which one can almost hear the brutal laughter and the obscene words. Looking at these pictures, one would naturally conclude that Holland was inhabited by the ugliest and most ill-mannered people on the earth. We will not speak of greater and worse license. Steyn, Potter, and Brouwer, the great Rembrandt himself, have all painted incidents that are scarcely to be mentioned to civilized ears, and certainly should not be looked at. But even setting aside these excesses, in the picture galleries of Holland there is to be found nothing that elevates the mind, or moves it to high and gentle thoughts. You admire, you enjoy, you laugh, you stand pensive for a moment before some canvas. But coming out you feel that something is lacking to your pleasure, you experience a desire to look upon a handsome countenance, to read inspired verses, and sometimes you catch yourself murmuring, half unconsciously, Oh, Raphael! Finally, there are still two important excellences to be recorded of this school of painting, its variety and its importance as the expression, the mirror, so to speak, of the country. If we accept Rembrandt, with his group of followers and imitators, almost all the other artists differ very much from one another. No other school presents so great a number of original masters. The realism of the Dutch painters is born of their common love of nature, but each one has shown in his work a kind of love peculiarly his own. Each one has rendered a different impression which he has received from nature, and all, 
starting from the same point, which was the worship of material truth, have arrived at separate and distinct goals. Their realism, then, inciting them to disdain nothing as food for the pencil, has so acted that Dutch art succeeds in representing Holland more completely than has ever been accomplished by any other school in any other country. It has been truly said that should every other visible witness of the existence of Holland in the seventeenth century, her period of greatness, vanish from the earth, and the pictures remain, in them would be found preserved entire, the city, the country, the ports, the ships, the markets, the shops, the costumes, the arms, the linen, the stuffs, the merchandise, the kitchen utensils, the food, the pleasures, the habits, the religious beliefs and superstitions, the qualities and effects of the people, and all this, which is great praise for literature, is no less praise for her sister art. End of section 50